Acast recommends podcasts we love. Welcome to the legend that is Vicky Field. Siobhan Murray. Ryan Mack. Jason Byrne. Endura. This is MC Abdul. Me chatting to my friend, Mike. The Keith Walsh Podcast. Chats about life. Sometimes funny, sometimes deep. Always meaningful. Drops twice on Monday and once on Thursday. I always wanted to say drops. Part of the Acast Network. Acast powers the world's best podcasts, including the Irish History Podcast, The Two Johnnies, and the one you're listening to right now. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Connor, and welcome to this week's episode of Intelligence Squared. Today, we're joined by Ian Urbina, who many of you will remember has been on the podcast before. And in this episode, he spoke to Helen Chersky about the Outlaw Ocean Project, which investigates crimes on the high seas from illegal fishing to human rights abuses across the world. It's a really fascinating conversation with some updates on his previous investigations, as well as on the Outlaw Ocean Music Project, which is inspiring people to care about our oceans through the power of music. If you do enjoy it, you can find a link to support the Outlaw Ocean Project and all the great work that they're doing in the podcast description. But now, let's go to the episode. Hello and welcome to this Intelligence Squared podcast. We are here today to talk about a very weighty but fascinating tome, and it's The Ocean Outlaw. And the author is Ian Urbina, who is joining us today on, you know, just off a ship, which feels very appropriate. And we are going to be talking about all kinds of things. Just to introduce him a bit, he's an investigative reporter. He's written extensively for The New York Times, The Atlantic and The New Yorker, especially on human rights and the environment. And he has won a huge pile of very high profile awards for doing all of this. And a decent chunk of them were, were for the book that we're going to be discussing today. And the book is the book was published in 2019. And I'm an ocean physicist. I spend a lot of time complaining that people don't talk about the ocean enough. But Ian has found the bits that are talked about even less than that, which is both a considerable achievement and a considerable service because he has been in some pretty grim places, I have to say. So, Ian, I'd like to start with a question that actually I'd normally ask near the end, which is that, you know, you this book is all about the things that happen on the high seas that we don't think about at home. And you spent five years travelling and researching this. There's sea slavery and smuggling and corruption and stealing things, stealing ships, a lot of violence, up to including murder. And the entire point is that none of this is rare. And I just wondered, you've written about all these things. You spent this massive amount of time thinking about all these things. Now it's done. There's this book. How do you... How do you feel? If, if you, are you glad to have left it behind? Are you relieved? Do you, are you cross you couldn't do enough? Like, what's your reaction having finished it all? Well, I mean, it, that's just the problem. I couldn't put it down. I didn't finish it. Um, you know, they always say that, you know, books are not finished, they're abandoned. And, you know, in this case, that felt truer than most other projects before. And so I took a year after finishing the book uh, did another series uh, for the New York Times about ammunition and found myself pulled back into the space. So I decided to return to these topics and dedicate another five years to reporting. So, you know, the stories in the book still are alive. And, um, uh, you know, just yesterday we wrote a story updating uh, an investigation that started in the book. So just to get everybody started because I guess a lot of our audience won't have read the book yet but I hope that after this they will all go and read it what's what's the thrust of this what what did you do and why does it need doing yeah I mean so the owl ocean is a book about and really now a line of reporting about the two-thirds of the planet that's water and it really approaches this space anthropologically if you will as a frontier that attempts to correct several things in the way that, in my view, that frontier has often been approached journalistically. One, it attempts to expand the diversity uh, of what people understand to be occurring out there and sort of show that when you speak of maritime crime or human rights and environmental abuses out there, it's not just Somali piracy or the BP spill. It's, as you mentioned, it's murder of stowaways, it's intentional dumping of oil, it's arms trafficking, it's sea slavery, it's illegal whaling, it's abortion providing, it's repo men who steal ships at sea. It's it's this myriad 
you know, kind of thicket of, of activities out there, not all bad, but relatively under discussed. Point one. Point two, we wanted to approach the place um, first through the people, you know, 56 million people work offshore and you rarely hear from them or about them. A lot of them are scientists. Some of them are in industry. Many of them are fishers, you know, and, and so uh, being a former anthropologist, I wanted to use the humans as the entrance into the space, getting to the marine issues, which are urgent and important, but that felt like a fresh way in. And and ultimately the, the ambition is to make uh, of the reporting is to make the point that there's a dire lack of governance, there's a dire lack of transparency and accountability out there. And the sort of steady stream of reporting will educate and stoke urgency about that fact. I think it's it's really interesting that it's so hard even to explain basic things like how big the ocean is i remember when that plane was it mh370 went down and people were like how can you lose a plane and you're like have you seen how big the ocean is and then you know i and a lot of other physical oceanographers spent hours on basically on tv shows going it's really big it's really hard to find things and that was a plane <laughs> you know right. and it's this yeah. kind of do you do you find that it's hard for people to believe that there's space for all this to happen. Yeah, I mean, you, you said it perfectly. And, and you were speaking in the the layman's terms of the ocean surface. And, and as you better than anyone as an oceanographer know, um, f- forget about just how expansive that surface is. Um, to think of the sea floor legions down, you know, even just the mere mapping of the space down there is woefully inadequate. You know, so it's easy to lose boats on the sea surface. A plane that disappears below the surface is is very easy. It's a bit like out of space, you know, uh, in the sense of just how little we know and, and how few people and players there are, there are out there relative to the space. Now, one of the problems is apparent from your book and also from lots of other places is that you, I mean, you, you kind of said it in the title, it's the outlaw ocean. The law is is a strange beast at sea. So just give us an overview of what the laws are and and why they don't work, because they often don't work. Yeah, I mean, there are layers of don't work, right? One layer is the laws that apply to this space were historically crafted with a different set of priorities and by a different set of players than those on land. So there's a cultural sense that the oceans that, that, that really was codified in legal history, Mara Liberum and a guy named Grotius, you know, sort of codified this notion of the freedom of the seas was essential to the world economy. Uh, the high seas in particular should be this protected space where people can travel freely it's owned by everyone and no one and no one should be bothered by either government forces or pirates or others when they're attempting to traverse the space so the spirit of the law was less protective of rights and aiming to prevent abuses than it was protective of freedom okay so in the very core of the way governments and law envision the space, you have a difference. Then you have the reality of the the very point you made, the geography of it makes enforcement virtually impossible. So laws are only as good as their enforcement. So even with laws that were written mostly by diplomats, not by lawyers, mostly by fishing lobbyists, not by human rights and labor advocates, even with that, you have laws on the books that then are very tough to actually enforce and police. So that makes them relatively toothless. And then thirdly, you have this element of who the laws are, well, who the abuses are largely targeted toward, right? You have two types of victims. You have the humans and you have the marine environment. Neither of those has a constituency lobbying group, right? The the ocean has lots of advocates and researchers who voice on its behalf, but it's not a vested interest like many other sectors in society would be. Then secondly, so the marine environment lacks a voice in many ways. Then the people out there who, especially not, not so much in merchant marine, but in fishing, those who are the victims of these crimes tend to be of a demographic that are woefully underrepresented. So they're typically from the global south, global south, they're typically migrant workers, they're typically undocumented, and they're transient, 
on vessels that are sort of have five different nationalities involved, the insurers from one company, the flag state is another, the owner of the ship is a third, these guys working the ship are from a fourth, the officers are from a fifth. So for all those reasons, they're extremely invisible victims. So those three layers are why laws just don't work very well out there. Well, let's get, so the book goes through various aspects of, of the laws not working very well. So, so let's get to some of those. So the fishing, fishing is the, the obvious one to start with, and it is the one you started with. And I have to give you credit here, because normally with a book, you know, there's a big dramatic beginning, and then, and then it kind of not exactly tails off, but it softens a bit after that. Yours starts with a big dramatic beginning and then gets worse, which, <laughs> which is, a, you know, I mean as a compliment to you, but also as a comment on the situation. <laughs> So so this chase scene that it starts with, there's a rogue fishing vessel called the Thunder. And there's this, you know, somebody has a go at trying to catch this ship. And so tell us who that was and why it was so hard. Yeah, I mean, the, the first chapter about this epic chase was sort of a textbook and quintessential exhibit number one for the outlaw ocean concept in the sense that on both sides of, of, of the chase, you had extra legal players. On one side, you had these conservation, sort of vigilante conservationists who describe themselves as such um, by the name of Sea Shepherd, which is this organization that's a direct action, sort of advocacy organization, very well funded, has a fleet of ships, a lot of Hollywood money has bought it, and they patrol the oceans in many of these voids where governments aren't doing what we would hope they would be doing. And, you know, they're well known for ramming whaling ships in Antarctica and sort of earn their reputation as wild characters for doing that. This ship, this chase, this campaign of theirs called Operation Icefish set out to do something a little different. They were not going to ram vessels that were engaged in illegal behavior. They were going to target these vessels that Interpol had put on a special list called the Purple List, which essentially is a most wanted arrest on site bad boy actor list. And to, to be a ship and to end up on the Interpol's Purple List, you really have to have worked hard, you know, and, and you know, have well-documented crimes over a, a good period of time. The Thunder was the top of the list. They'd been stealing Patagonian toothfish uh, for almost a decade, $67 million. And Sea Shepherd said, look, we're going to embarrass the, the governments that should have been doing this a long ago, and we're going to embarrass the culprits by going and finding the Thunder and then chasing them. And every time the Thunder attempts to pull into port to unload its uh, ill-gotten catch, we're going to, you know, put out press releases and call reporters and really, you know, shame the government for not arresting them on site, i.e. show the toothlessness of the very laws, right? And so the, they did just that. They, they, amazingly enough, found the thunder nets in the water in the Southern Ocean. They sort of attempted verbally to make a citizen's arrest. The thunder bolted, ran, thus began a 110-day-long chase that spanned 10,000 miles, along which, you know, there are these epic twists and turn, the thunder went through this, you know, impossibly dangerous ice field that you really don't go through if you're a ship in an effort to shake their tail, you know, to, to lose the people chasing them. That didn't work. They went through a category five storm that normally most sane people wait out. They went through the middle of it. At one point, the thunder turned around and actually began chasing the Sea Shepherd guys and trying to ram them. Long story short, the thunder lasted 110 days near Sao Tome, Principe, an island nation near the coast of Africa, the thunder decided to sink itself. They, you know, evacuated their crew and sunk the ship, ostensibly to bury the evidence that would be used against them. And the Sea Shepherd folks picked them up from the water and handed them over to law enforcement. It is one of those things that I, and I think there's a lot of this in this book, is astonishment that this could happen in this day and age. The, the the idea that, you know, think of all the things we might have, well, four months, the last four months at the moment, most of it's been locked at home, not done very much. However, in the four months when this was going on, you can do a lot of things in four months. And the idea that these two players are out there and, I mean, some people, you know, you knew they were there. Some people knew they were there, but most of the world is just getting on with it. And they're just engaged in this epic chase and no one knows and no one really cares. I mean, it, that's amazing, isn't it? And wrong? It is. Yeah, it's really striking. And it shows you how big and small the world is all at once, right? It's small in the sense that we're all complicit. You know, the supply chains, the very toothfish that these guys are catching likely would be ending up on the restaurant table of, you know, your local Hilton or Hyatt Hotel in the US. So we are connected to what's happening 
out there. And at the same time, and, and just technology is also connecting the chasers with everyone on the world who cares to pay attention. You know, they're, they're, they have a satellite phone. On the other hand, this whole thing is happening worlds removed, not just the sort of plane flight away, but then out in the Southern Ocean where you can't even get a plane out to them. It, it feels like um, a sort of law enforcement action in, in space. You know, it, it feels that distant. So you touch on something, because I think the other thing is that when, as you go through the book, a lot of these issues are, they're not that far, as you described, they are physically quite far away, but they're not that far away. And in that first chapter, I think you mentioned the concept of fish laundering, which, I mean, I just love the phrase. I hate what it stands for. Tell us about fish laundering. Like money laundering, which essentially is taking money that has problematic association, either it you know, was ill-gotten through illegal means and you need to make it look legitimate or what have you, it's counterfeit. Or Fish laundering is similar in the sense that you're taking things that, were, that, that are illicit and you're trying to clean them up vis-a-vis public perception. And so you're, you're either engaged in the process of catching one fish and selling it named as another You know, like, um, yeah, this is tuna, but it's something that tastes like tuna or this is cod, but, you know, that's that's counterfeit and that's part of fish laundering. Or you're catching it in places you weren't supposed to catch it or in ways you weren't supposed to catch it. And you're cooking the books uh, so that it looks like that's not the case. And that's what fish laundering is about. So for people who eat fish, you know, in our society, I I happen not to eat fish and I was actually quite glad about that afterwards. But um, is there any way they can know whether the fish they are eating have been laundered or not? With certainly, with certainty, no. But th- there are tools out there, and I often point folks to one of them, but not the only, Monterey Bay Aquarium. You know, they do a lot of really good research, both on the conservation and marine issues and concerns about is this type of fish coming from a stock generally that's on the verge of collapse? Is it coming from a region of the world that's notorious for you know, slave labor or illegal fishing. or So they do a lot of good ranking and guidance. So, you know, you can, you can check there. It's also, you know, not to be cliche, it's, it's, it's not a bad idea to try to really gear local, you know, and, and shop local for both climate change reasons, just the sheer carbon footprint of transporting that stuff from abroad, but, but also, you know, local economy point of view and uh, from a labor and environmental perspective, your risk, is much less if you are buying local. So th- those are some things you can do. So, there, I mean, there's, there are some horrific statistics about how much bycatch there is for fish, but there is a, a quote a few chapters further on that really caught my eye, and it was that deckhands are the real bycatch. And this that's a very chilling thought because it really places the value of a human on level with the value of a fish almost. But that's kind of the situation, right? Explain that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, so bycatch for the non-anointed, you know, experts listening is essentially when you catch marine species that are not your target. So if you're fishing for tuna, but you net dolphins and turtles and, and, and forage fish and other things in the process, they're killed, but they're not consumed. And it's a distinctly wasteful problem. And so marine scientists and regulators and law enforcement attempt to enforce methods of fishing that have lower bycatch numbers. To refer to the people, the fishers themselves, the workers as bycatch is uh, sort of a reference to two realities. One is, you know, on fishing vessels, often the deckhands themselves have fewer protections than the cargo, in this case, seafood. So insurers, for example, put very detailed contracts on the books with the shipping companies and the fishing companies about the cost of any damage, any delay, any payment snafus. But when it comes to the labor contract that is set up, if it even exists, which is rare in the fishing space, that is set up to protect the people. And I've looked at hundreds of labor contracts and they're unbelievable. I mean, they're the things that would make Dickens blush. I mean, those contracts are written to protect 
the employers, not the employees. So, so I think that's one level in which these fishers are really the bycatch. The other level is in, in some places, especially in distant water fleets um, around the world that rely heavily on migrant and undocumented workers, um, you know, there was a statistic of UN interviewed deckhands from the South China Sea, mostly Cambodian on Thai vessels, and 49% of them had witnessed murder on board of other deckhands. We that should just pause and say that number, 49% had yeah. witnessed a murder. Yeah, yeah. And this was a peer review. This was really legitimate interview data of these deckhands. They were anonymized and, you know, all these things. And 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 I've done trucking, coal mining, sex work. Like I've, I've, I've done a lot of investigative reporting on pretty gritty industries. I've never seen numbers like that, you know. So it's really brutal workspace and, and just further testament to, you know, if a deckhand misbehaves, there's a decent chance in, in some places in the world, they will be severely beaten, if not killed, to sort of show the other deckhands. Don't forget, you know, this is a bit like a plantation in that there are only maybe four or five officers and 40 crew. And the crew are often young men, right? And the officers are often older men, you know, my age. And so the chances of mutiny are very scary to those officers. So there's a lot of performative violence that's meant to set the tone early on. And that sometimes results in murder or severe beatings so that everyone knows that the smallest infraction will have, you know, felonious consequences. Acast recommends podcasts we love. To the legend that is Vicky Fina. Siobhan Murray. Ryan Mack, Jason Byrne, Duran. This is MC Abdul. Me chatting to my friend Mike. The Keith Walsh Podcast. Chats about life. Sometimes funny, sometimes deep. Always meaningful. Drops twice on Monday and once on Thursday. I always wanted to say drops. Part of the ACAST Network. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts, including the Irish History Podcast, The Two Johnnies, and the one you're listening to right now. One of the most shocking things in reading the book, in all the very shocking things, is how consistently humans are exploited. That they are like the, these workers who are on the back deck of a ship fishing at all hours with dangerous equipment at night in heavy seas. Basically, nobody cares about them. And that's the legal bit. So to get more to the illegal bit, there's a quote from Moby Dick that you start chapter eight with, which is one of those things that feels a bit evergreen in the wrong kind of way. And, and it's, it's this. In this world, shipmates, sin that pays its way can travel freely and without a passport, whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. And basically what he's saying is that if you've got enough money, you can get away with anything. And so, but you have a case this week in all of this doom and gloom. Your newsletter this month or the update to it mentioned a case where somebody just once didn't get away with it. Tell us about that. So this is a case that that was really striking. It involves a video that was on a cell phone that was found in a taxi in Fiji. The video on the cell phone is 10 minutes and 26 seconds long, and essentially it's a slow motion slaughter that was filmed at sea. At that point, when we first began investigating it, I was provided the footage by a source at Interpol. We had no idea where at sea that had occurred, when it had occurred, who was being shot, and who was doing the shooting. But in the video, you you hear in Mandarin and some other languages, Vietnamese as well, orders being given to to what sound like two individuals wielding semi-automatic weapons who are summarily taking shots at these flailing men in the water who are clinging to what looks like wooden wreckage of some sort. They see the ships that are engaging the shooting are several. There, there are three. They're very large Taiwanese tuna longliners. You can't see the shooters, you can't see the person giving the orders, but it's this sort of visceral, carnal, visceral sort of event in which they're trying to kill these guys. And they succeed in killing four, and you see them headshots, water in the blood, uh, blood in the water. And at the end of the video, the the witnesses, if not culprits, some individuals on board, uh, on board the shooter vessels, uh, celebrate with 
you know, joyous selfies and the video ends. So this is super egregious in so many ways in the sense that here you have a case of mass murder. The guys in the water, no matter what they did before, maybe they were pirates and armed and they were attackers. When you see them in the video, they're unarmed and no longer a threat. So this is clear murder. It takes a while. So it's fairly premeditated. You have faces of people who are witnesses to the crime. You have voices of those involved. We were able to identify the ships that were at the scene. Uh, again, Taiwanese tuna longliners. And the, the real crime here is that it took seven years. Last Friday, the captain was convicted to 26 years. It took seven years for that to happen. And it really only happened because of journalism, you know, not mine alone. We put it on the front page after a year of investigating, put it on the front page of the New York Times and really sparked a sort of international effort. But amazing work by a private investigator named Kars von Hoesland and a bunch of other players that over the last seven years, we've worked together to um, apply pressure and uh, to the Taiwanese and the Fijians and others. And finally, they uh, arrested the captain. And on Friday, they convicted him to 26 years. So perhaps some optimism in a horrible situation. So that one of the questions that, that comes up often to anyone, anyone reading the book, I think it certainly did for me, is how do you fix this? You know, you describe governments shuffling the blame onto other people and ship owners just either pretending they're not there or fiddling the books or it's always somebody else's problem and nobody wants it to be their problem. And I think there's one country, can't just remember offhand which one it was, who did take a better approach and all the ships just went elsewhere. How, like, what's the way out of this? Is the, the sea, the oceans have been lawless for as long as they've existed. Can we turn this around? Yeah, your example was New Zealand. I mean, yeah, I think to take three steps back before I arrive at your question, I mean, number one, how does one reckon with the outlaw ocean? Well, I think the first thing to do is recognize you can't solve the outlaw ocean, right? It's almost like saying, how do we win? How do we stop injustice? It's too high altitude a question and shouldn't be attempted to begin with. How do we, so, so don't tackle the war, instead focus on the battles and, and try to win as many of those battles as you can. So in the outlaw ocean space, I would say the outlaw ocean, the, the ocean will probably remain outlaw in, in some fashion or another indefinitely. But whether we can impose more governance on specific elements within it, murder of stowaways or murder with impunity or sea slavery or uh, ocean plastic or illegal dumping or whaling, what have you. But those, each of those problems has distinct fixes. There are some that traverse all of them, you know, and those are the ones I would say focus on first that could help solve the variety. And I'll, and I'll get to that, but just so as not to be demoralized, I wouldn't speak at that high altitude. Now the, answer to fixes that actually can traverse traverse a lot of these issues. One is, you know, the kind of journalism, not to be self-serving here, but keeping a steady public uh, consciousness about what's happening out there is vital to keeping pressure on consumers about their buying choices or big buyers like companies and governments about their choices keeping pressure on governments and lawmakers about thinking about these issues as they pose legislation that are meant to solve other problems. As donors, you know, we all give to things, organizations, you know, keeping these priorities up high on your list. So I think journalism plays a big role. I think also just technology is very promising. There's a lot of really interesting stuff happening out there. You know, little nations that don't have navies or coast guards uh, can't really effectively police, except they can get a lot of help from NGOs like Global Fishing Watch and others that uh, use satellites to monitor these spaces. Uh, so I think that's one big thing is to support organizations that are providing that kind of big picture um, tracking. And there are other fixes which are listed to some degree in the book. The, the use of technology is really interesting here, I think, because it's it's there's so many areas at the moment. And perhaps George Floyd is one of those cases where somebody had a camera phone. And, you know, in that situation has almost certainly happened one way or another, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of times. But this time, someone had a camera phone. And are, are you optimistic about that kind of technology providing the evidence? Because I guess that if you want to make this visible, ultimately, it's, it's, it's always going to be my word versus your word, unless someone's got a video. Is that going to be helpful? 
Yeah, I, I really, everything you just said, it, it really is hugely democratizing in in the George Floyd sort of way, the ability to document these things that have been going on for a while. And, and, and you know, deckhands, uh, trafficked migrant, you know, deckhands from Cambodia or Somalia often have cell phones, you know, and, and not much else. But, and so there, there is real bottom up potential to capture. And in my reporting, there's example after example, the murder case is one, but there are plenty of others where thanks to the footage that deckhands had captured, I could better verify what they were saying and show people what they were experiencing. So, so the sort of bottom up and then the, 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 the sort of top down satellite potential, both of those directions coupled. And there's also sort of in the middle capabilities that are being pushed now by some organizations onboard cameras, you know, to keep track of the, the kind of catch and the type of gear and the working hours and stuff like that. There's a lot of effort to, to possibly impose that sort of technology on fishing companies as a third way to monitor. So... All of the, there's all of these big issues. I absolutely encourage everyone to read the book. But once you had written the book, I don't know if this started before or after the book, you got going on a music project. <laughs> Tell us what the music project is all about and how it is linked to the ocean, the outlaw ocean. It's, it's a weird thing, I'll say up front. Wonderfully weird, but a weird thing. The, the music project was this experiment that I and a, and a team of about four or five other people um, launched on about a year and a half ago. It had as its goal several things. One was, what if we put a, why should movies be the only things with soundtracks? Why can't a book have a soundtrack? And wouldn't it be neat if better than just a soundtrack to the book, you know, kind of using the language of music to evoke emotion that's in those words and in the characters and scenes, wouldn't it be even neater if we could have these musicians, be they hip hop, electronic, classical, whatever, use actual sounds from the reporting. So we set aside three months and went through six years of footage and stripped out the most interesting sounds, you know, thinking of sounds almost like a cook thinks of ingredients, seasonings, you know, so machine gun fire in Somalia and the chanting Cambodian deckhands on the South China Sea, interesting stuff that grabs the ear and pulls you in and built this sound archive. And some of its words, you know, Secretary of State John Kerry at the UN talking about, you know, some of the reporting and interviews with the Tanzanian stowaways, just really interesting seasonings, right? And then we put them at the disposal of musicians and said, hey, would you be willing to make this charitable contribution of your time and creativity and brand and audience? And would you read this book and figure out what within it moves you and then make a five track album in your own style, use these seasonings as you see fit, none, lots, wherever, however, and then hand the the album back to us. And then we're going to use it to help take this reporting out to a, a broader audience globally and a different demographic within the audience. Because my 17-year-old son, for example, won't listen, won't read the New York Times, much to my annoyance, but he does consume a lot of news and information. He's very well informed. He gets a lot of it from comedy and TikTok and, and Facebook and and Spotify, right? And he listens to obscene amounts of music and watches these videos. And I thought, well, if he's like, you know, a 17-year-old in Caracas or Taipei, um, then maybe we should bring the journalism to them where they are rather than trying to get them to come to us. And maybe this musician music project will help do that. So we pair the, the albums with footage, again, tact, tactfully, hopefully, and respectfully done, but we pair the music with videos of the footage and written material and sort of use it almost like a, as an on-ramp from people who listen to the song, get curious, what, why is it called that? What's that footage about? You know, what's that sound bite for? And then they go looking and off they go from Spotify over to our website. So that, that was part of the experiment. And we thought we would do a half dozen of these. And now we have 470 musicians from 80 countries. And, you know, we put out 50 albums every two months and the revenue from the streaming is the other experiment, you know, these stories are obscenely expensive to produce. It's why you see rare them rarely. And, uh, you know, I have a piece coming out in the New Yorker in a month and it costs, they're paying 8,000 bucks for it. It costs about 108,000 to produce. And so that gap is, 
you know, something we have to fill with subscribers to my newsletter and donors, but it's still not a lot enough. These musicians and the streaming revenue, 50% of the streaming revenue goes back to the musician and 50% of it goes to a nonprofit, the Outlaw Ocean Project, which produces more journalism. And so that's the other element of the experiment that we're engaged in. Well, media people, I mean, one of the great problems at the moment, I think, is the lack of funding for media. So I, that, I had never heard of that funding model, but good luck to you with that. <laughs> but so what, what's the reaction of those musicians? Because I imagine, you know, I don't mean this to sound bad, but there's very little in your book that's pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's important, but it's also very uncomfortable. And and you're giving these musicians some very raw, emotive things, even if it's, you know, illegal fishing, if it's not actually murder, if it's just, you know, fish being caught or things being thrown over the side that shouldn't be or, or people being thrown over the side. Do they do they feel that responsibility? What's their reaction to the situation? Yeah, it's a really good question. There There are two categories. There are those that approach the book and say, hey, look, I make music that's meant to be uplifting and happy, and this is not that. There are heroic, inspiring figures in the book, but they're not the majority by any means. And those musicians are encouraged and simply embrace the the positive elements, the inspiring elements, the heroic figures that are doing things and really focus on those things. And their songs end up coming out in their style, uplifting. And it's often ranging from a sense of awe and marvel at just the marine space and also songs about these heroic characters. The the majority of the musicians are dark folk like me and you, I think, who feel that, you know, we have to look at this ugly reality and not look away from it. And a lot of these musicians seem really delighted by the opportunity to take their craft and feel like they're doing something more than entertainment and, and use their music to get people to feel more about these invisible problems and people. And so, and, and then some of them are in the middle and they just love the sense of drama. And so the music comes out as sort of a, you know, Hans Zimmer, Max Richter style, you know, dramatic score that just feels epic and adrenaline filled, but it's not negative or positive. It's just action. So it sort of spans the gamut, but, but I've been most motivated by just how seriously the musicians take the content. They read the book, they really become fluent in the issues and they take um, the translation process to heart. Fabulous. Well, very sadly, we are out of time. There, there is much more in the book. Everybody, I think, if if you haven't read this book, you should go and read it for lots of reasons. But it's it's it opens a door on a world all of us should be more aware of. I think so. Thank you very very much, Ian. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. If you have listened to this, uh, thank you to everyone who has listened to this or watched this. If you're watching on YouTube. You, there will be episode, uh, links for the episode somewhere below or nearby wherever you found the recording. So you can find out more about, you can Google the Ocean Outlaw Project, but there are links uh, and to the music project as well. So please do go and have a look at those and support them. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Acast recommends podcasts we love. To the legend that is Vicky Fiena. Siobhan Murray. Ryan Mack, Jason Byrne, Endurin. This is MC Abdul. Me chatting to my friend Mike. The Keith Walsh Podcast. Chats about life. Sometimes funny, sometimes deep. Always meaningful. Drops twice on Monday and once on Thursday. I always wanted to say drops. Part of the ACAST Network. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts, including the Irish History Podcast, The Two Johnnies, and the one you're listening to right now.